Okay, so in this early part of the data analysis uh, module, we are looking at univariate data, so single variable data. Um, and here we're going to, and we're going to look at a series of different representations for data. Um, and here we're going to look at bar charts. So let's start with an example. So we have a group of girls were surveyed on the sport that they prefer to play. The raw data from the survey is below. Okay, so we've just got a list, a random list, no clear order to it. You've just you know, asked um, a group of girls, well not a whole group, you might just ask them one at, one at a time, what's your preferred, what's, what sport do you like to play, what sport do you like to play? Um, so the first question is what type of data was collected in this survey? So it's definitely categorical data um, and there's no implied order in the sports and so it, therefore it is nominal categorical data. Okay, so the raw data has been organised and displayed as a bar chart pictured opposite. Okay, so we've got all the information there. We've got clearly 11 um, students prefer to play netball, three prefer AFL, four prefer hockey, five prefer softball, two prefer cricket, and five prefer tennis. Um, and we want to write down at least two observations from this bar chart. So again, pause the video, pick out two observations that you can make that say something about the data. So you might say, um, you know, netball is the most popular sport amongst this group. Okay, so we could say netball is most popular um, we could say cricket is least popular we could say um, equal numbers of students equal numbers of girls prefer number of girls and we should state um, a statistic so um, we should actually verify our statement with um, a statistic so netball is most popular um, 11 girls um, cricket is least popular only two girls like cricket equal numbers of girls five girls prefer sorry not play prefer um, Softball and tennis. Whatever it might be. Um, but particularly, you know, in the first two where you're sort of making a qualitative statement about the data, this is the highest ranked thing. This is the le least ranked thing. You should be um, verifying that with um, some statistics. And again, the number of girls is a bit meaningless as a, as a statistic unless you know the total number of girls. So we should probably say, you know, 11 out of... Um, we haven't been given the total, have we? So this is 11 plus 3, which is 14, plus 4, which is 18, plus 5, which is 23, plus 2, which is 25, plus 5, which is 30. So it's 30 girls were surveyed. So Nepal is most popular, 11 out of 30 girls. Um, cricket is least popular, 2 out of 30 girls, etc. Um, any two statements about um, the graph, though. So in order to produce the bar chart, the raw data would first have been collected into a frequency table. So actually a frequency table is generally the first port of call for a lot of the different graphical representations. So a frequency table, frequency simply means how often, how frequently does it happen. So the frequency table is simply about tallying up, you know, what's the frequency with which a girl liked netball, how many girls liked netball. So we can read that off the bar chart, I just tallied them up then, so 11... Um, preferred netball, three preferred AFL, four preferred hockey, five for softball, two for cricket and five for tennis, giving us a total of 30. Note that bar charts can also run horizontally, that's purely just a stylistic thing. Conventionally, if we are being asked to draw a bar chart or we're observing a bar chart in um, the further maths course, they'll generally be vertical bars, um, but it says exactly the same information in a horizontal bar chart. Um, the data could also have been presented using the bar chart opposite. So this bar chart you can see here on the right. 
and the question is how is this bar chart different to the one at the top of the previous page? So it's still the data about netball, AFL, hockey, softball, cricket, tennis. We're still seeing a similar shape to it, you know, softball and tennis are the same, netball's the biggest one, cricket's the smallest one. The difference is happening here, we were no longer seeing the frequency but instead we are seeing the percentage frequency. Okay, so percentage frequency. instead of frequency. And often we'll use percentage frequency because as I said to you up here, it's not very meaningful to say netball is the most popular 11 girls like netball without knowing, well, is that 11 girls out of 100 girls or is 11 girls out of, you know, 15 girls or is 11 girls, it doesn't give us a measure of how popular it is. So percentage is a much nicer measure of that. What percentage of, it doesn't matter how many people you survey, but what percentage of them prefer each each different um, category. Um, so we would have had to calculate those percentage frequencies. So that would have required an additional column in our frequency table. So we've got our frequencies and then we want to calculate our percentage frequencies. We want to think about make sure that we're aware of how we would calculate the percentage frequency. So if 11 girls out of 30 girls like netball, as a fraction, that's 11 on 30, and then to convert to a percentage, we would be timesing by 100%. So 11 out of 30, control enter to see that as a decimal, multiply that by 100 to write as a percentage. So as a fraction, it's 11 thirtieths. As a decimal, that's 0.36 recurring of all the people. As a percentage, that is 36.6 recurring of all the people. Uh, should have given some accuracy here. I'm just going to do them all to one decimal place. So 36 point, sorry, 7%. And we can repeat the same. So it'd be, you know, 3 out of 30 should be 1 tenth times 100. So it should be 10%. 4 out of 30 times 100 to convert to the percentage. 13.3%. Uh, 5 out of, sorry, 5 out of 30 times 100. 16.7% and that's, that'll be the same for this one and 2 out of 30 times 100 6.7% now I suspect that if we rounded up I'm um, sorry if we tallied up these rounded percentage values I'm just going to do that here 36.7 plus 10 plus 13.3 plus 16.7 plus 6.7 plus 16.7. What we actually find here is that they add up to 100.1%. That's purely just an issue with the rounding because one, two, three, four of those numbers are all rounded up, whereas only one rounded down when we did the rounding. Um, and so overall we've ended up with a slight um, rounding error in the total because we should obviously have a total percentage of 100%. You don't make any adjustments to your numbers. That's per, per purely just connected to the um, level of rounding. Now you wouldn't select to round to one decimal place. I did because the question didn't specify, but the question will always specify if you need to round a value to what level of accuracy you need to round it. Okay. So if you're rounding off a number, make sure that you're not just choosing randomly to, to round it off to two decimal places because you feel like it, that you're doing that because something in the question tells you that that's how you should do it. Um, so write down a formula for calculating the percentage frequency using the frequency. Okay, so percentage frequency is the frequency of the given category over the total number of pieces of data multiplied by 100%. Okay, so use your formula for percentage frequency to complete the frequency table above, which we did. Um, rounding your percentage is the nearest whole percent. Okay. <laughs> and now I read the question properly. It's the nearest whole percent. Okay, so let's let's check our rounding here. So um, this one was 36.6 recurring, so that would go to 37%. And uh, that was exactly 10%, so that's all good. 13.3% um, would round down to 13%. 16.7 was 16.6 .6 recurring, so that would round up to 17%. Again, this was 6.6 .6 recurring, so that would round up to 7%. And this was, oops, sorry, 
7% and this was 16.6 .6 recurring again so that would also round up to 17%. So again we've got 1, 2, 3, 4 numbers which we rounded up and so hence if we add them up we find that gives us 101%. So as I said that's okay, that's purely, we've answered the question, we've told us to round to the nearest whole number, you don't make an adjustment just because it doesn't add up. Um, so it's quite possible that your total percentage total might, depending on the rounding, might be slightly more than 100%, might be slightly less than 100%, and that's okay. Um, the data might also have been presented as a stacked or segmented bar chart, and this could either be done using the frequency or the percentage frequency. Um, more commonly, the percentage frequency, though. If we did the frequency, the total number of girls we surveyed was 30, so we've got a numeric scale that goes all the way up to 30, and we simply just divide it up. So we've got 11 in netball, then another um, three in AFL, then five in hockey, then, no, sorry, it was four in hockey, five in softball, two in cricket, and another four to give the total of 30 people, 30 girls. Um, or you can do the same thing in percentage frequencies. Okay, so as we saw up here, 37%, so that's, you know, 37% there, a netball, and then it's an additional 10%, so now we're up to 47% on the, um, you know, scale. And then it's an additional 13%, so now we're up to 60%, 47 plus 13 is 60%, so you just keep stacking them on until you've got the total 100%. Now again, because this is nominal categorical data, there's no prescribed order in which you have to put the bars in the bar chart or the segments in the segmented bar chart. Um, you can choose. There does need to be some sort of code or key, and if you're working in black and white, you might, um, you know, so you're doing it by hand sort of thing you might divide um, a bar chart using sort of, you know, stripes, colour in one section and do dots or something, and then you would need a key to say the black bit represents such and such, and the dotty bit represents such and such, and the stripey bit represents such and such. Okay, so it does need to be a key in a segmented bar chart. Um, all right, so we've seen how the raw categorical data is organized into a frequency table. It could also be displayed using a bar chart, either vertically or horizontally um, orientated. Um, we could do a stacked or segmented bar chart. Other graphical representations are also possible. Pie charts are quite common. They're not part of the further maths course, but there's plenty of other um, representations that can be used. Once the data is organized in some ways, this early part of the data analysis chapter is really about how are we going to organize our data and present it so that it shows some meaning, so that it tells us something. Okay. So once the data is organized, um, we might be, um, we can then see a bit more about what's happening and we could be asked to describe the data distribution. So for example, for this distribution of data, we might say 30 girls were asked about which sport they prefer to play. The majority of girls, 37%, nominated netball as their preferred sport. Tennis and softball were the next most popular sports, each nominated by 17% of the girls surveyed. Other sports mentioned were hockey, 13%, AFL, 10%, and cricket, 7%. So when you're describing the distribution of a categorical variable, the following things should be considered and thought about and included in your description. Summarize the data and the context in which it's being collected. So that is, is it a survey? Did you, um, you know, how, if you know, how was the data collected? And how many pieces of data were collected? That's important. You know, was this a big survey and therefore the data might be quite, you know, transferable to the wider population? Or is it just a very small survey and, and this just represents, you know, one class of girls or whatever it might be at a school? Um, so you want to give that context, how many pieces of data do you have and how was it collected. Um, you want to state the dominant or modal category, so the most common thing should definitely be mentioned, and support that by giving the relative, um, sorry, the relevant frequency or percentage. As I said, if you're going to give the frequency, so if I were to say the majority of the girls, 11, oh, because well, I've given the total of 30, that's still meaningful, okay? So but there does need to be the mention that it's 11 out of 30 girls for that to be useful if you haven't got the total knowing the frequency doesn't tell you anything. I'd probably tend to go for percentages in the description. Um, if the distribution is spread relatively evenly across the categories, that should be mentioned. So, you know, even though you might get slight variation, let's say the netball, we surveyed fewer people, let's say the netball was down here too, you know, you might sort of make a comment about the fact that things are pretty even. Um, you know, softball and tennis are marginally more popular, but um, 
you know, there's an even distribution across the categories or something like that. So you want to mention that. You shouldn't be making overly exaggerating, you know, the fact that one category is the most popular if it's only most popular by 1%, for example, or, you know, 5%. Um, uh, include percentages or frequencies throughout your report to support your comments. If there is a small number of categories, you should mention each one. So you notice I mentioned all the categories here. But if there's a lot of categories, you don't need to mention each one individual individually, perhaps just, you know, What's the, what's the most popular thing, what's the least popular thing, and maybe if there's an interesting fact in another category or a couple of categories, you can mention those. You know, most popular, second most popular, maybe the least popular. Um, you know, you have to use some judgment there. Bar chart conventions, make sure it's got a title. What is the data, um, what does the chart represent? What's the data, um, what's the variable being measured? Um, so um, you want to label both axes. Okay, so the vertical axis would be frequency or percentage frequency and the horizontal axis would be, you know, in this case, preferred sport. Um, you want to, and obviously labelling each of the bars, so, you know, tennis, basketball, whatever it might be. You want to take care when you scale the axes. So if your scale's uneven or if you skip values or um, you skew the scale, then your bar chart won't represent the data properly. You know, something as simple as, you know, you draw your netball bar wider than your other bars can really over-exaggerate how much bigger it is. So same widths are important. You know, you want to make sure that you evenly space things so that, you know, sometimes you might have, I don't know, you might have your netball and your whatever and then something else here and then, you know, I don't know. There's sort of something weird about why is this one on its own and maybe it makes it look smaller or bigger or visually different. So you really want to aim for consistency so that the things that are different uh, uh, show properly in the way that they should. Equally, your frequency scale needs to be even. You know, if you sort of scale your axis randomly and you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and you draw a bar chart, you know, this is actually only twice as many people as this, but I've drawn it both wider and my scale makes it look four times as tall, so it's really misleading. So, you know, use a ruler, you know, use the lines or, or grid paper you might have available to you in a question in an exam and make sure you draw it accurately if you can. So exercise 1B is the um, exercise relevant to bar charts.